we have three people for pig, if not. <laughs> All right, yeah, um, you. You are in. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bring this meeting to order. I hope everybody's here. Um, I'm David Stewart. Uh, those of you who are hoping for Dave Stewart, lead guitarist for the Rhythmics, I think you'll have to try the music colony here. But <clears throat> if you want to know something uh, about the Dave Stewart, know something about differential variation and qualities, you're in the right place. Because that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, differential variation and qualities are a, uh, are a framework with some significant theoretical support that we can use to model, and I'm going to talk about uh, these models. Uh, I'm going to talk about, there's a very crucial quantity that's involved, which is the index, which separates different kinds of differential variational inequalities. Um, and also talk a little bit about numerical methods at the end. Okay, and that should take up my hour. So, let's get started. Um, a lot of people have influenced this work. Um, differential variation and qualities uh, were um, coined by John Chi Pang, actually. Um, we had differential complementarity problems, and he said to me, Dave, we need to do something about variation and qualities, and that started us on this. Um, so, um, my first paper in contact mechanics with Jeff Trinkle. And uh, there's lots of other people I've worked with or at least discussed things with. So uh, I just want to say thanks to the people also who should perhaps be on this list, but should, which aren't. Um, there's only so much room. But okay. First of all, what do we mean by differential variation quality? It's a combination of a differential equation, which involves not just the state space, but also an algebraic part or a variational inequality part, um, where we, which satisfies a variational inequality, which we've got here, the solutions must be in a certain closed and convex set, and this inequality must hold whenever z tilde is in the same closed convex set. Now, um, variational inequalities arise in, for example, convex optimization. They're also related to complementarity problems. Uh, if the set K is a cone, that is, if you take a point in the set and multiply it by a non-negative scalar, you still stay within the set. Okay, so uh, that's what I'm saying here. Uh, if K is also a cone, then the variational quality part becomes a complementarity problem. And K star here is what we call the, this thing here, is what we call the dual cone. Uh, in particular, if uh, K is non-negative orthant of uh, component-wise non-negative vectors, then the dual cone is exactly the same thing. Um, people will also be talking about second-order cone complementarity problems uh, later on. Um, okay, that's the case where K is sort of an ice cream cone, where you have, uh, it's a uh, right-angle cone at angle 45 degrees. In that case, the dual cone is the same is the same set. Uh, if you have k is Rn, then the dual cone is just the zero vector, that's all that's in it, in which case we have uh, this big G function has to be zero, and z of t is free in Rn, and our differential variational inequality becomes a differential algebraic equation. Uh, which has been analyzed by, um, by a number of people, uh, particularly for numerical methods. And they use this for, um, you probably know, it's used for mechanical problems where you have hinges and uh, things like that. Okay, now for us, inequalities are important because we have to deal with, uh, we have uh, <coughs> contact forces that only arise when you have, when inequality, inequality becomes an equality. Okay, so just to go back to this, this is a variation of the quality, it can be used to describe a number of things, but can also, if you have complementarity problems, it can be put into this framework. Okay, why do I want to work with these things? The, the variation of quality variable K 
can jump. And this is important for discontinuous right-hand sides, for differential equations, and it can even contain impulses for impact problems. Uh, in that case, we have an unbounded z of t, where we have an impact from an impulse. We represent that with using an unbounded set k. Um, and if we... Yeah. Um, yes, we have impulses going out if in the direction in which you can go to infinity in k. There is a substantial amount of theory for variational inequalities, which we want to leverage. Uh, it can be applied to finite dimensional and infinite dimensional or partial differential equation problems. And I'm going to talk about uh, infinite dimensional problems for elastic bodies as well. Uh, it goes beyond the theory of maximum longitudinal operator differential equations, which is, was developed in the early 70s by Chaim Brezi. Um, it's a very powerful mathematical framework, but we're going beyond that. So David, is the only thing that can change disc discontinuously here the z? The x will be a continuous variable they, in time. The set, uh, okay. I'm trying to map this into a really simple mechanics problem in my mind. Which is why right. <coughs> um, now there has to be a little bit more structure for when you have impulses. So the trouble is that if we have z as an impulse here, we might have the potential that uh, dx dt jumps instantaneously, in which case you have the question, what is the value of x you should use here? And that is going to affect, change the, the strength of the impulse. So you've got to have it structured so that that doesn't matter. So the state space would, uh, in that case, would be separated into a q and a v, a generalized state vector and a velocity, and it's the velocity part that can change instantaneously. Okay, so it, it can be put into this framework with a little bit more structure. Right. Um, shameless commercial plug, recent book, uh, came to Siam 2011. Um, it's uh, sort of packs in a lot of the stuff I've been working on for the last decade. So, have a look at it. Um, okay, now you'll see this, uh, I've got the example of impact problem, which is what we are, many of us are interested in. It's index two, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. So this is simply a ball on a table, and simply to show you that we can put this into the framework of differential variation inequalities. We have mass times acceleration, uh, we have a gravitational force, and we have a contact force. The contact force is not negative and is only, can only be positive. This can only be positive when this is zero. That is when we have zero separation. So it's the usual complementarity between normal, con normal contact force and separation. And there's also lots of PDE models of impact. Okay, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to explain what this index 2 means. Um, there are a number of other applications. Uh, the circuits with diodes is one, so we're not mechanical. Uh, it's not a mechanical problem, it's electrical. Um, but we have complementarity here because the, you can have a back voltage across an ideal diode, in which case you get zero current flowing through it. Or if you have positive current flowing through it in the direction indicated by, the, by this, uh, that means that there is no back voltage and the forward voltage is effectively zero. That's an ideal diode. Electrical engineers will tell you that this is not, you have to tweak this a little bit, um, but it's a fairly good approximation in lots of situations such as with power systems, uh, power circuits. Okay. Uh, there's index one. Uh, Coulomb friction. So I also have to deal with friction. With mechanical contact, so we have we write this in terms of the velocity, and here I've got the velocity, here's the velocity down the ramp. Uh, mass times acceleration is the downward gravitation component of the gravitational force minus the friction force. And in this case, we have a variation in quality here between the friction force and the velocity. Okay, and the set K 
uh, depends on the normal contact forces, mg cos theta. Um, the real, com the com real complexity with uh, Coulomb friction is the interaction between normal contact force and the friction force. Uh, here, at least, we have we know we can work out what the normal contact force is independently, and that gives us a uh, differential variational inequality of index one. Okay, now let me explain what this index is. Okay, now the idea of index was used by people in differential algebraic equations. I'm the definition here is a little bit different from theirs. Uh, it differs by one. Now, the idea is that the index of the DVI is the minimal m where the nth derivative of this function that we use in either the complementarity or the variational inequality equals b of t for a given b of t can be solved for z of t perhaps after doing, uh, well, after doing all substitutions of derivatives from the differential equation. You can write that as a function of t and x of t. So let's go back and see how that applies here. Okay, on the one side you have n, on the other side you have y. You need to differentiate y twice using this to get the normal contact force coming out, okay? Which is the variational inequality variable in this system. So that's index 2. I haven't got differential equations written out for diet circuits. In fact, it's, rather, it's uh, a somewhat non-trivial exercise to show that it is indeed x index 1. Coulomb friction, uh, here, we have the variation of the quality variable f, we have a state variable v. But we only have to differentiate v once in order to get the friction force coming out. So it's index 1. So that's how we can tell what the index is for these systems. Uh, you can have mixtures of index 1 and index 2. And in fact, the full Coulomb model is both uh, is a combination of index 2 and index 1. OK. Um, the theory of uh, the theory that's being developed for differential variation of qualities depends crucially on the index, and that uh, that tells us what kind of existence uniqueness theory we can get. Index zero is the simplest, okay? In which case, g of t x z equals b of t can be solved for z, okay? As a function of t and x, okay? Once you've got that, you can just substitute back into the differential equation, and we have a nice differential equation for our state variable. Um, and the standard differential equation theory applies. So that works very easily. Index 1 is where things start getting interesting. Uh, typically, the z variable does not appear in the g function. We don't have g of t x z, we get g of t and x. And it turns out that uh, we need, generally it's efficient, for the Jacob, this matrix, Jacobian of G times B to be positive definite or elliptic in infinite dimensions, to get existence, to get uniqueness, we usually, it is sufficient to that this matrix here be symmetric. Um, in some situations we can, we can prove that we can allow a little bit of movement away from symmetry, but things start getting rather tricky in uh, having to deal with that. So uniformly positive definitely is not enough? Uniformly. For uniqueness? Yeah, for uniqueness. Uh, Correct. Can you give us a little intuition on that? Sorry? Can you give us a little bit of intuition on that? Yes, we'll get to that in just a moment. We will. Uh, index 2, impact problems. Existence can usually be shown, but not uniqueness. Now, part of this non-uniqueness with impact problems is the coefficient of restitution. Okay. The formulation that I had up, um, okay, I, perhaps I can go back to it. Okay. 
There is no coefficient of restitution here. Okay? And so there's non-uniqueness in this respect to start with. But it's worse than that. And it's worse than that. Um, there's work by Patrick Ballard, who is currently at um, uh, CNRS in Marseille. And uh, he's been able to show that even with rigid body dynamics, with a given coefficient of friction, there are, in fact, multiple solutions. They're fairly complicated to construct, but there is non-uniqueness. Okay, this is a problem with uh, rigid body dynamics. But, uh, existence, uh, sorry, exit index three and higher. Uh, simply put, uh, existence usually fails. Uh, there are some alternative formulations, and uh, Vince Dacari has, uh, has he worked with. Bernard Broliato on developing some ideas in this direction, but it definitely requires some uh, fairly strong structure and a reinterpretation of what the conditions mean. Um, basically, it's, it's because uh, if you have, okay, index zero, the variational, the VI variable is going to be a continuous function, usually Lipschitz, of time. When you go to index 1, they can have jump discontinuities. Index 2, you can have um, delta functions, you can have impulses. When you go to index 3, they would need to be derivatives. You'd need to allow derivatives of delta functions. And the trouble with these is that is trying to define what you mean by non-negative. Um, and Normally, in the theory of distributions in which you can have derivatives of delta functions, uh, you can't go beyond delta functions and have things that are non-negative. It just doesn't make sense. But if you have certain structure that's fairly strong and you reinterpret things, you can get a way of getting some meaning out of this. But with this uh, approach that I have, it's no longer a uniform framework or approach. It's, it's something different. So, um, and there's usual, there's another issue which is the idea of, um, there's a principle that I like to keep which is that a limit of solutions is also a solution. And that can fail with index 3 and higher. Um, <coughs> fractional index, okay, so I mean, if you're differentiating, usually you have to differentiate a whole number of times, but there's also a fractional index. Um, where, okay, what do you mean by fractional index? Okay, that can occur with these kinds, this kind of problem. Now, this is a convolution complementarity problem. So we have a complementarity relationship between Z and this. And what we're doing is that we're representing the dynamics of the system through an impulse response function through a convolution with the impulse response function. And that's our M here, M of T, and that gives, that's our convolution. Now, if we have, if M of T has the form T to the power alpha, sorry, T to the power alpha minus one, let's say, uh, at least asymptotically, as t goes down to zero, then it has index alpha. And we can make sense of this uh, index, um, existence and uniqueness for index, uh, you can have, we can prove existence and uniqueness for index alpha between, strictly between zero and one, or alpha equals one, and uh, m at zero plus the, the value at zero is symmetric. You're going to get existence for alpha strictly bigger than 1 but less or equal to 2. Like I said, I don't want to go beyond index 2. Because then we have some problems about what, what do we mean by a non-negative function. Right. Now, these kinds of problems do actually, they do have application uh, in particular for things like uh, a viscoelastic rod impacting 
uh, an obstacle can be represented in uh, actually a purely elastic and viscoelastic rods can be uh, dealt with in this way. If you have a purely elastic rod impacting at one end, that can be represented as a convolution complementarity problem with index alpha equals 1. Uh, and for which you can show existence and uniqueness. For uh, a kelvin voigt viscoelastic rod, which includes uh, it's, it's the usual kind of viscoelasticity we deal with, uh, for a rod, uh, we find that we get we can do the same kind of process and we'll get a convolution complementarity problem of index one and a half. Yes? Does the tuition make, intuition make sense that you know, index two means you're differentiating twice? Index, uh, fractional index yeah. means you're differentiating in some way that's not... How do you do that? Right. So, take this m of t. Um, if you differentiate it uh, okay, it's the number of t times you need to differentiate it to get a delta function at t equals zero. So if we have alpha equals one, what's happened here? Um, okay, for alpha equals one. Uh, we differentiate, if we have m of t is a jump function, so that this here is a symmetric positive definite matrix, so. Um, if we differentiate that once, we get a delta function at t equals zero. Uh, if we think of, uh, okay, if we have um, a rigid body, and we apply an impulsive force to it at the time t equals zero, what happens to the position? Well, let's see. Uh, we integrate once to get the velocity. That has a jump discontinuity. And do integrate twice, and we get a um, yeah, position moves in a linear function. Are you getting so to the point of where you actually differentiate like one and a half times? That's, yes. This is a stupid question. <laughs> yes. Okay, yes. Okay, sorry. So, yes. Uh, but you can represent that uh, differentiation... Uh, you can represent differentiation by a fractional amount in terms of uh, ordinary differentiations, it's a whole number part, and the fractional part uh, comes through convolutions with powers of t. It's doable. Uh, there's been a lot, I don't know uh, how many people have heard of it, but uh, there's been a lot of work uh, by people interested in fractional differential equations where we use this so we can have uh, a half order derivative of something. Uh, that's become fairly popular amongst people working with things like diffusion type equations. So. Well, what I want to do is differentiate it once and differentiate it twice and then make a convex combination, but I guess that doesn't work. <laughs> no, uh, no. I think in some ways it's best to look at it in terms of, say, Laplace transforms or linear uh, systems okay. theory. The Laplace transform has to be the appropriate power of S, okay. the Laplace transform. Right. So if you think of it in that way, um, that's, one, that's one way to, to get to it. Any other questions? All right. Uh, index 1, um, applications, coolant friction, diode circuits, traffic flow, networks of queues, uh, some... There's quite a few non-mechanical applications. Infant dimensional versions, maximum monotone operator, differential equations, and parabolic variational inequalities. And also, um, I don't know how many people work with Filipov discontinuous ODEs, where you're just a differential equation with the right-hand side just can change discontinuously, at least on the boundaries of certain regions. Like this. Can you see that OK? So we have, uh, in this example, we have some sort of indicator function h, and on this side of the curve it's positive, over this side it's negative, and we have different right-hand sides for a differential equation on the left and the right side. We've got f plus on the left, and f minus over on this side. Now, uh, Philip Paul showed that we can have existence, unique, uh, existence of solutions provided on the discontinuity 
we allow the derivative to be anything in the convex hull of the values on each side. And so we can write, express it in this form, where z of t has to be between 0 and 1, like here, and here's our variational equality way of representing how, which one you should use. So if h is positive, then uh, we get, if h is positive, then we get z equals 0, and if h is negative, we get z equals 1. Um, and we can look at this. Uh, this is the corresponding B matrix that we have to work with, and there's the G function. And so the crucial thing to look at is this, Jacobian of G times B, which just turns out to be this dot product, so the gradient of H times that, the difference between the right-hand sides. And if it's positive, the solutions exist and are unique. If negative, then we can show... We can still show that solutions exist, but they're not unique. Okay. Um, is it, have people uh, is it people played with these things before? Yeah. Not specifically, but does, isn't this the same sort of thing that comes up in switching controllers? Um, it's the yes. same sort of mathematical structure, right? Yes, yeah, same sort so of structure as switching controllers. To solve problems of yes. control with friction, for example. Yes. Um, now, notice that what can happen, what can happen is if we've got uh, our vector fields pushing us towards the discontinuity, then on the discontinuity, at least in engineering terms, what you get is chattering. Where you, because of very slight delays in the system, you're going to jump backwards and forwards across the discontinuity. You go from one side to the other, and you then get pushed back over. And so you get this uh, rapid chattering. And so what you get is an average of the two of the two vector fields along there. And that's where you get the convex hull like this. The convex combination of the two right-hand sides. Um, when you have, uh, that's when they're both pushing towards the discontinuity. If they're both pushing away, it's still possible to stay on the discontinuity by choosing the right combination. But it's unstable in the sense that if you move off slightly on one side, you get pushed off on one side, and you go a little bit the other way, you get pushed off the other direction. So you get the multiplicity of solutions, and solutions are not necessarily unique. Okay. Now, non-uniqueness can arise for index 1 DVOs when this is not positive definite, then it's it's like that situation that I just described. If the two vector fields are pushing away from the discontinuity, you just go hop a little one side or the other and you just get pushed away. You go one side or the other. And can happen spontaneously. Okay, the variation inequality might have unique solutions in itself, but the DVI, the differential, when you couple it with the with a differential equation, you might not get uniqueness. And this involves what are called reverse Zeno solutions. Now, I've had our previous speaker already mentioned Zeno solutions. So, Zeno solutions, when you have infinitely many changes of the uh, discrete component, or uh, might be infinitely many changes of sign of certain quantities. Uh, within a finite time interval. Now, reverse Zeno in the, <clears throat> a reverse Zeno solution is where you have a, a certain critical time. Before this, we don't have uh, changes in the state, in, in the mode of the, the system, at least for some short period of time. But immediately afterwards, we have infinite many switches. Um, it can be a little bit hard to grasp how this uh, how this happens. I'll try to give an idea of what happens. Um, so here's a very simple class of differential variational inequalities. We have the, the dynamics. The right hand side does not include W at all, but we have this complementarity relationship between Z and W. And here's uh, matrix M. 
<coughs> now, this matrix is not actually positive definite, but it is a P matrix. Now, a P matrix is important because they mean that your complementarity problems have unique solutions for any right-hand side. So, that means the complementarity problem has solutions. You might therefore hope that the differential variation quality would also have unique solutions. Alas, no. You get this kind of behaviour. Uh, you can get a solution that stays at the origin because um, the convex hull of the vector fields includes zero at the origin. So you can stay at the origin. But if you move off ever so slightly, you get this outward spiralling motion that will give you a different solution. So you get multiple solutions. And uh, you, could, you could create solutions by saying we start and stay at zero for some period of time, and then some arbitrary time we say we're going to move off. And it spirals out. And why does this have the reversing of phenomena? Because each, when it crosses each of these, we have a switch. But it's still only finite. It's not but if you, if, you, no. if you traverse this... Because you're starting at the origin. Time. Yeah. Things yeah. going backwards in time, right. anywhere, any point in this trajectory, oh. if you go backwards in time, you're going to have to go through infinitely many switches oh, okay. yeah. to get okay. to the origin. Oh, okay, so you, you reverse in time. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's, that's a reverse you know, solution. And that's basically the only way you can get non-uniqueness where solutions to the variational inequality are unique. Okay, index one solution. Index one. Effect. This is an index one problem. Index one problem. Yeah. This is an index one problem. It's many bars, isn't it? Yeah. Many um, Actually, um, this one is actually not Mandel bounds. It's uh, Bernard and El Carube. Uh, they, they did this in the context of um, looking at uh, stochastic differential equations. But that's a example, example of this. No. It's very similar. Oh. Yeah, the, picture look, the pictures are going to look the same. Oh, so, okay. um, R.B. Mandelbaum, <clears throat> unpublished manuscript from 1989, so it's quite a while ago. Uh, it's a more sophisticated example. It's two by two, and the matrix is positive definite. Now, I don't have the... The, the matrix itself up here. Um, but you do need this f of t being... You can also find this example in the book of Yudkin in the 60s about sliding mode control. Okay. It's quite old example. Okay, so, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Well, it was not even a member box example. <laughs> I see. So it's Yudkin, yes. There's probably a paper on papyrus somewhere where they did this. <laughs> is, that, is that a Russian? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. 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 I, I know the name. But you know, he's, of course. He's, he's, he's in U.S. Uh, since. Yeah, but when he did the work, he was in Russia. Yes. Post-1990, doesn't it? Of course. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> not right. I, I, I actually know the name Woodkin in connection with you know, hysteresis and other kinds of non-smooth yes. phenomena. He studied the stability of the systems. Mm. And due to the fact that you have a definite positive two matrix which is not symmetric, you can still prove the stability of the system. In forward time, not in backward. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, but in this in that case the f of t, that is the inhomogeneous part, let me go back. So the f of t here for the Mandelbaum slash Utkin example. Um, that f of t has to be uh, definitely non-zero, non-constant, and in particular, it is not analytic. It can be smooth, uh, even c infinity, but it's not going to be analytic. Um, and the way to show that there uh, there are multiple solutions is you need to. Um, find a solution to this differential equation that satisfies this inequality. Uh, it satisfies that inequality. Actually, uh, the way to construct a solution, you need to find a solution. I should have actually put, instead of uh, the dot product, I should have had the component-wise, I had a mark product there. 
Okay, so these kinds of um, non-uniqueness can occur in situations that you wouldn't want it to occur, but usually in those cases it has to be through some sort of reverse Zeno process like this. Um, this is a, a different kind of topic. Um, I needed some tools that I could apply for these particular problems that would that would um, that you could that went beyond just the obvious things that you could have by saying Here the, here's what we know about variation equalities, here's what we know about differential equations, let's try to use the union of the two. This goes a little bit beyond that and it's useful in mechanical systems for dealing with things like uh, conservation of energy and I'll explain why. Okay, so if we have two functions that are complementary their dot product is always zero and a of t belongs to k, b of t belongs to the dual cone of k uh, and they're sufficiently regular then you can show that the dot product of the derivative of a with b is always going to be zero. You can show that the dot product of the derivative of a with the derivative of b is going to be less or equal to zero and uh, second derivative of a with b of t is always going to be greater or equal to zero. Uh, the first one is probably the most useful and that, that's the one that get, uh, gets you conservation of energy, for example. Uh, sufficiently regular can mean a bunch of different things. Um, okay, so here the derivative of A happens to be an LP in an LP space, that is the pth power. Integral of the pth power is finite. Uh, here, b, the qth power of b is an integrable function, and the p and q have to be dual exponents. Or, a can be a function whose derivative is continuous, and b can be a measure. Contain impulses. Um, and here's for Sobolev spaces. So there's sort of a, for the mathematicians, this kind of duality structure that you can use here. Okay, and so that's for the first case. Now, the other cases, it's, it's actually fairly similar. As long as you can uh, differentiate and everything, uh, things, the A and the, the appropriate derivatives occur in dual spaces, this usually works. Where it doesn't work, though, here is when um, A is a function of bounded variation and B is a measure because you can have an impulse occurring exactly where you have a discontinuity of A and then this doesn't work. Okay. Example of how I can apply this sort of thing. I, I can express those in the integration form, right? And don't you still need the regularity if I express those with in terms of... Right, so... Can, or, or the inner product is already in the integral, right? So this, right. Okay, so for example, a, uh, a rigid body model might have something like this, mass matrix times the VDT. This comes from the uh, generalized coordinates that you use. We've got the negative gradient of the potential function. And we have the, let's uh, see, phi of Q is, has to be greater or equal to zero. So this uh, N of T is a normal contact force, suitably generalized. Uh, dQ dT is V. We have complementarity between the normal contact force and the separation from the uh, feasible boundary of the feasible set. Uh, what happens with the energy? So what, what space does K live in? What, what, in your, your cone and your dual cone live in for, for that problem? Sorry, here or yeah. in the previous? Uh, this, this example here. So um, The space, uh, the cone is the cone of non-negative vectors. Oh, in this case, uh, N of T is just uh, for a single contact and this is a scalar function, so this is um, non-negative real numbers is our cone. The dual cone is the set of non-negative real numbers. Yeah, if you go if you go back to the original definition for dual cone and just trace through what it means, then it comes out fairly easily. But do, does this satisfy your conditions from the previous slide? Say that again. Does this satisfy the conditions from the previous slide? 
the way we have evolutions? We'll get to that. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And it helps explain some things. Okay. Uh, differentiate the energy. Um, just use the usual rules. And we get this. And uh, the, this term here, uh, you can relate to the little k of qv. And you can eliminate that. And you end up with this expression. The dark product of velocity with the gradient of phi times n, which is just dt of the constraint function times normal contact force. Now, what do we know? We know this. For energy conservation, what do we want? We want this to be zero. Okay? Can we go from this to this? Yes, if they are suitably regular. Okay? Now, here's the problem. As long as the forces are bounded, then phi of q is going to be sufficiently regular. That's great. But, if the normal contact force has an impulse, then the derivative here can have a jump discontinuity, and it doesn't fail. Okay, so, that just says, if I have uh, rigid bodies in, in contact, then I'm going to have conservation of energy until there is an impulse. So it's only in collisions that you can have loss of energy. No other time. Okay. So, does that answer your question? Um, okay. 20 minutes. All right. Parabolic variational inequalities. Uh, here's an example. This is an um, obstacle problem. Okay. Obstacle problems. Um, yes. I have a question about the previous. Um, yes. Sorry. Uh, even on the previous slide. On the previous slide. Okay. You have a key. This pot does it provide potential energy? Yes. I mean that comes from the when you. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of the formula for K of QV. It involves derivatives of the mass matrix with respect to Q. Okay. Yeah, it's... Uh, but, like if you... It's, it's for your semi-rigid body, it's like the, the, an elasticity or something? Um, but it's more like... Right? It includes Coriolis forces and the like. Uh, Ki of QV is a sum uh, one half. Okay, okay, okay. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. No, 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 that was not my question. Go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> So you've got different expressions <laughs> like this. <laughs> but my question was, was if, if you imagine that you have, if you are not, because it was the, the definition of semi-rigid, I, I thought maybe you can have like a, a, an elastic, consider the fact that the object is elastic, a little bit elastic, yeah, and I, then maybe you, you would have a term of potential energy in your definition, and then maybe you can uh, have a, to keep you, to keep your energy during the contact. Uh, yes, yeah, so for example, if you have uh, with compliance models, for example, could be included in this. Um, uh, let's see, so that way, uh, yeah, if you have sort of, a, sort of a mass with some springs around it, then you could treat it as a compliance type model you can put in this framework. Um, and then you would get, you could show conservation of energy. So, so, so far, with your question, then you have not included friction in any of these models, right? Uh, this is not including friction. Um, I have, oh, I'm sorry, previous one. Yeah, but this one doesn't have friction. This one does not have friction in it. Um, How would that change? How would your conclusion change in this case? Of course, uh, friction is explicitly dissipative. So, uh, you would, uh, what do we need? 
Then you could show that the rate of change of energy is equal to the force dissipated by the oh, friction. Okay, 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 yeah, okay. That's what would come out. Okay. There, what it says, what it ultimately says, is that there is no work done by right. the contact forces. Okay? Then why, why don't you sort of, it's not DE, but you can use the word, in, you use a term that also includes the dissipated energy, and then now the whole thing can be. Um, have a sort of energy storage function for so so right now you I mean you include friction your energy term I mean according to what you said is that you should include some commanded term that the DDT is equal to the what uh, the equal something right? DDT right. so when you have friction then that would now you know you don't you no longer get that right so uh, things are. Okay, you have to change the differential equation. Anyway, we incorporate that. Let's continue. Okay, so we have the M of Q, VDT is equal to negative, grab V, Q plus K of Q, V um, plus uh, minus say D of Q beta, and we have some uh, conditions for beta, uh, have to, which will generate on friction. We can do that. I'm going to, I've actually got a formulation later that's, that's got all that in it. We talk about numerical methods. Okay, so we'll get to that. Okay, um, so you can deal with certain kinds of uh, partial differential equation problems in this framework, Alaska, including elasco and viscoelastic bodies. And I'll go through this fairly quickly. So uh, normally, if you have an uh, elastic body, you write out the equations of elasticity. It's going to be uh, density times the acceleration of the displacement field uh, is equal to the divergence of the stress tensor plus any external forces or body forces acting on it. Uh, we have uh, stress tensor times N is negative normal contact force times the normal unit normal direction vector, average pointing, on the boundary of the region. And we have complementarity between the normal contact force and the separation. And this applies at every point on the boundary. So this is a uh, differential complementar a partial differential complementarity problem. Yeah. And it can be dealt with in this framework. Um, and you could use this as a starting point for, say, developing finite element methods for it. Uh, okay. Stress tensor for linearized viscoelasticity. Um, this is actually Kelvin Voigt type viscoelasticity. We have this for uh, the pure elasticity, and this is the kelvin voigt viscoelastic part, which involves the rate of change of the strain tensor. The strain, this is the linearized strain tensor, which is just the one half, well, it's just the symmetric part of the Jacobian matrix of the displacement field. For pure elasticity, the Bs are all zero. Um, okay, we can describe this in a more abstract way involving, okay, is this for PDE type people? Any PDE type people here? Okay. Uh, at least I'm talking to someone. Okay. Um, we also need the trace map, which takes the, um, okay, so this is a function defined over the entire region, and this basically gives us the um, sort of normal displacement on the boundary, so it's that trace map. Um, and we need its adjoint operator, which takes a function on the boundary and it gives us the corresponding uh, force. Because what usually happens with uh, elastic bodies and impact is you have contact on the boundary. So you have to concentrate, you have a sort of, uh, sort of a delta function on the boundary that you have. You can write it like this. So you can write it as a uh, uh, differential, partial differential differential complementarity problem. Um, and existence has been shown for B elliptic, so it's a real Kelvin-Voigt viscoelasticity. 
Uh, this is shown by uh, Marius Kokou uh, at Marseille. Uh, extended by Kaku him Kaku himself and um, Ken Cutler and Mayu Schiller. Ken Cutler is at Utah, Mayu Schiller is Oakland uh, in the Detroit suburbs. Uniqueness is an open question, although I think I have a negative answer for that. Um, energy balance. Now this is a viscoelastic, so you can't expect conservation of energy, but you can show that the the energy that is dissipated is dissipated purely through viscosity. Um, existence for pure elasticity has been shown for the wave equations by a compensated compactness. Uh, that was done by uh, Jong Un Kim. No, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's think. Was that Jong Un Kim? I think it was. Yeah. But it involves a thing called compensated compactness, which is very tricky to apply, and you can't even. Sh no one has shown existence for um, pure elasticity for, isotro for isotropic linearized elasticity. So that's a mathematical question that's still unknown. Numerical methods. Finally, I've got 10 minutes. So, um, Index 2. Index 2 is sort of at the extreme end of what we can handle in this framework. So it shouldn't be too surprising that we've got to be a little bit specialised about how we deal with things uh, numerically. The methods must be implicit. Um, we use, uh, typically use low order, just or first order. There's often, there is, let me say, often, um, okay, um, it's, it's certainly tempting to start off with just low order methods because when you deal with impact you uh, do not have smooth solutions and so we can't expect to get high order accuracy. Unless we do some method of approaching the point at which some discontinuity occurs and then restart on the other side. And that way you can, might be able to get higher order accuracy. If we trust our contact model at the event. You have to trust your contact model at the event, and that, that is an issue. And uh, actually, I have so, something to say about that when I give my other talk a bit later. Okay, so this is now you wanted the, the friction model, so here's the full friction model. Uh, mass times acceleration, we've got the normal contact force, we've got the friction force, the potential energy part, and the Coriolis, etc., forces, and we have the external forces. Rate of change of generalized position is the generalized velocity. We have complementarity here. F here is now the, I should have changed that to phi, um, is now the uh, constraint function. This here, if we have a psi that we can use a psi to represent what the friction cone is, uh, for a regular uh, right handed ice cream cone, uh, then this is going to be the uh, psi is going to be the 2 norm. The ordinary Euclidean norm of beta. Uh, D, of Q, D of Q, the columns of D of Q give it, um, our basis for the, the tangent plane in which the for friction force acts. Uh, we need this Landris Lagrange multiplier. That's the, this being non negative is the, gives us the um, allowable Coulomb friction forces. Uh, lambda is used here and here, connects those two. Uh, and these two together give us essentially the maximal dissipation <coughs> version of Coulomb's friction law. Um, yeah. And this here is, you can put this in where epsilon is the coefficient of restitution. Okay. Just to be clear, this is for a single point contact for this simple example. Yes. Oh, but it actually, it but still it works. Right. Um, right. It's, this condition still actually applies even if we have sustained contact or if we have multiple contact, you know, a Zeno type situation. Okay. Uh, we can do a time discretization. Um, this as given is actually for, okay, I've got the... Uh, Coefficient restitution in here. 
So it's, it's an implicit method. So at each time step, you have to solve a linear complementarity problem. Uh, yeah, the way I've got it set up. It's implicit in the forces, but not in the positions here, because I've got QL in here and here. And I'm using QL rather than QL plus 1 here and here. Perhaps you can say that beta are more than inverse than the forces. Sorry. Small inverse. Small. Beta. It's homogeneous, so multiple, not a forces. Something which is forces by the time interval. Same for lambda, right? Yes, the same for lambda. Lambda and beta are impulses instead of force. Right, so we're actually, what we've actually got are actually short time integrals of these. Yes, that's what we're it's approximating. Right. Okay. That, that way we're able to handle. Uh, both impulsive forces and continuous forces in the same framework. So here you're going explicit on the internal energy, right? Um, yeah, so I'm assuming that the, uh, the, say the, normal, uh, the normal direction vector is not changing significantly over the time interval. So those things are I'm doing treating implicitly that makes it Gives you a linear complementarity problem rather than a nonlinear complementarity problem. No, you're still not nonlinear. You use QL plus one. Uh, yeah. So okay. Uh, oh, the M. Yeah. Um, and that's one. Was there a reason why? I did, oh, I sh yeah. Perhaps I should use MQL. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there was a reason for doing that. I don't think so. What? Yeah, unless that was positive, but then you can Convergence convergence of this, at least for the fully implicit case, was uh, this is essentially this is uh, very close to the um, my paper with uh, Jeff Trenkel. Um, well, I think you use QL there. What? I think you use QL there. I think yeah, probably do. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah typo, typo. It's, and it's I have, a there's, a big, there's a big paper on um, archive of rational mechanics and analysis where I have the proof of convergence of this, which is a monster 40 page paper. Um, okay, index 1 DVIs. Now, these are a little bit easier to work with. Um, and I just want to basically finish up with this. Uh, you can do a time discretization for using uh, Runge Kutta methods for these. The runge Kutta methods aren't just any runge Kutta methods, they have to be implicit, they have to they have some fairly strong properties. But we can apply uh, runge Kutta methods to these and as long as the solution is smooth, these will give high order accuracy. Now, I know that we're dealing with non-smooth problems, so we don't expect non-smooth, we don't expect smooth solutions. However, we can use this and use it up to a point where there is a transition and then restart on the other side. As long as, if we're not dealing with xenotype solutions, then this can give us um, fairly high order accuracy. But in that case, you can also use explicit methods, right? Sorry? In that case, you can also use explicit methods. If you stop and you restart. Um, these methods do need to be implicit in the uh, variational, variational inequality variables. And one of the reasons why, um, okay, one of my early, uh, actually this is for the mechanical impact problem, but it illustrates the kind of things that go wrong, is that if you take an explicit method, if you cross over the feasible region, then on the next step you have to have something that pushes you out. And if you do your... Um, I did this in my first simulation with, um, with my method, first method for mechanical impact. And what happened was that the, you violated feasibility, and on the next step, it got pushed out, and as a result, the, uh, the ball would go, hit the air, and go, boing, like that. Um, because I wasn't being working implicitly in that part of the, the system. That should have been implicit instead of explicit. But if you manage to, to find the time of, it, of, of contact? Um, just okay, if you find that very accurately, then you could probably get away with it. Yeah. Can you guarantee solvability of this system? Provided the step size is small enough, 
under some fairly uh, general conditions. Yeah. With this, but this looks complicated. It looks complicated, but there are ways of handling it. Yeah. Do you think uh, that we can guess also the regularity of solution? Sorry? Can we guess the regularity of solution? Let us imagine that I'm not able to have a result, a mathematical result on the regularity. I want to use such type of method, mm -hmm. but I need to guess in some sense the regularity if I want to use the right order. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, that there is some numerical tricks to do that? Or? You mean uh, during the computation? Yes. For, for instance, we can try to compute some practical error estimation. Yes. But can we do something for the order? Basically, it comes down to sort of a non-degeneracy type conditions in the variation in the quality. Because there's going to be certain points where if you cross over some threshold, like if you have uh, the Coulomb friction, whether the velocity goes through zero, then you have to uh, change, uh, then you might get a switch. So up until that point, you can, you can do that. And then um, when you get velocity equals zero, then we've got a problem. Okay. Uh, so, last slide. <laughs> Um, the room quota method that you use in that has to be algebraically stable. It's a well-known condition for the numerical IDE community. Uh, involves some, satisfies certain uh, consistency conditions of uh, John Butcher. And you can have a look at his book to read what those conditions B of P and C of Q are. There has to be a diagonal matrix with positive diagonal entry such that a is the matrix in the Butcher tableau, provided that is positive definite. Again, this is something that is understood within the ODE community. And the method is what is called stiffly accurate. And that is basically the, the B vector is the last row of the A matrix. And there are methods that satisfy all these conditions. The rat out 2 a methods satisfy them. And you can have arbitrarily high order methods. Uh, if you have an S stage method, that means you have uh, basically S systems of equations to solve, then you can get order H to the S, at least. So I've been able to prove that. Uh, this is work that is, um, I've got a paper that I've been writing and I haven't, um, which, haven't which been published method, yet. Which method is guaranteed to solve the time discrete type problem? The previous one. The previous? Yeah. These ones? Uh, yeah, which, which method is guaranteed to compute? Um, the Rado 2A methods will, will can do it. Uh, the only thing is that, the only thing is yeah uh, discrete problem yes the discrete problem is solvable for this. Um, provided we have yeah that's why we need the uh, this condition here. That condition is needed. Okay. Oh, um, there's one other little thing, and that is that the Jacobian of G times B is symmetric. Ah. And positive definite. Okay. okay. So, so that can sort of condition has to. <laughs> uh, well, no, I can't get everything. I mean, well, the theory the says you can't get all of this. I'm not going to be able to do this. I guess there's also a question whether it's worth it, right? Because you don't know the, the impact points and you just simulate. Have you actually tried to simulate this versus just the implicit scheme? Will this run of that better method actually give you better results, whatever better means, than just the implicit scheme? I haven't done the numerical experiment. Yeah, so the question is I, I understand. Yes, yeah. so we're going to do the numerical experiment. I'm going to do the numer numerical experiments for this to see how good it is, but you can do integrate, uh, locate where that switch happens, where this continuity occurs, yeah. and then restart the method afterwards. And provided you don't have too many of these kinds of discontinuities, yeah, but there's then so you many ifs, right? So the question is whether it's <laughs> worth it to, to try this right. kind of high order. And there are going to be systems where it's not worth it. Yeah. When you have, for example, very large, say, uh, granular sy systems of granular bodies or something like that. Where you're going to have a lots and lots of switches with any, within any time interval, then it's not worth doing anything like this. And you're not going to get higher order methods. Yeah. If, if you are able to guess the order for the next time step and to adapt just the order of your method, then it can work. Because you don't know yes, how, this is you one know step how, method. Yeah. how long the next step is. The next step will just, just be very short. 
Okay, when I say the next step, I'm gonna say, you can go back to short tissue phase, but, uh, yeah. How do you do these methods if you're in the context of the PDE framework, when each uh, space node has its own time point of impact? Um, yeah, these methods, I don't think can handle at least the theory that I've been able to get for them have, can handle that. I, for example, if you had a, an obstacle type problem, then the, uh, the region of contact for the original problem might move smoothly, might change smoothly, but uh, when you look at it from the discrete problem, then you, you, you lose the smoothness. I mean, you, it, you're going to have uh, points at each time step. You're going to have points going from being out of con out of contact to being in contact, and each of those is going to cause a discontinuity. So that is not doesn't really work. I think to deal with that, you'd have to use some sort of moving mesh method as well. Maybe that could be done, but it's um, a much more complicated. Type of uh, solver. Why don't we continue this? Uh, yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah. We're going to meet back here at two o'clock for a photo, and then continuing on from there.